Hi, my name is James Sanderson, and I'm the Evangelism Minister here at the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. It has been very heavy on my heart lately to really do some short devotionals on the Lord's Supper. It's a very important part of our worship, and I just want to put some videos out there to help uh, members of the church on what to talk about, what to think about, as we uh, sit and commune with our Lord and sit at his table each and every Sunday. So if you would like these PowerPoints, give me a holler at the church here, and I would love to help you out. So let's get started today. Here's a question I think we need to answer. Why did Jesus have to die? So many times we, you know, we take communion every Sunday. We do this year after year, week after week, month after month. And sometimes we really don't think about what is going on here. So I really want us to answer this today. Why did Jesus have to die? That's going to bring us to 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Now watch what he's accomplishing here. It says, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now whose wrath or whose anger is he rescuing us from? This is God's anger. And why is God's anger coming? It's because of our sins these selfish things that we have done against God, that is what Jesus is going to do. He's coming to rescue us from God's wrath. And watch how he's going to do it. That brings us to Romans 3.25. Now, this is a big word. We don't use it a lot today. But it says, Whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, or the NIV said his justice. So that means that it'll hold up in a court system. So Jesus is God's propitiation. And what does that word mean? It means to satisfy. So Jesus is the one, the only one, who is going to be able to come and to satisfy God's wrath against mine and your sins. We could never do this. But Jesus can. And so God's wrath against our sins must be justly satisfied. This word propitiation. But watch how Jesus satisfied God's wrath against our sins in a justified way. Watch how he does it. So here's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he is beside himself. He is in a very agonizing place here. And why? Because Second Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. And so in that garden of Gethsemane, the night that he is going to be betrayed, all the sin, all of your sin, all of my sin, all of the guilt, the shame, the depression of it is being placed on Jesus. And he is agonizing. I just can't imagine what that would feel like for all of the world's sins to be placed on him. And then they take him away from that garden and they try him. They take him over to the high priest Annas. Then they take him to the other high priest Caiaphas. They take him before the Sanhedrin and try him, all these religious people. And then they take him over to Pilate. And Pilate sends him over to Herod and then sends him back over to Pilate again. And the whole world is turned against Jesus. Can you imagine this? The one that came to save us, the whole world is turned against him. And then what did they do? They took him and they flogged him with this thing called the cat of nine tails, where they take these leather straps and they tie bone and metal and bob wire and glass to the ends of it. And then they flog Jesus. They put him on a stump, according to history. And when that rips into the body, it pulls and it pulls the skin. And it pulls and it just turns Jesus' body into hamburger meat. And this is probably not too far from what the picture looked like. In fact, according to history, most people would die on that stump from shock to the body and they would never leave. But Jesus couldn't do that because it's not his time to die yet. 
he must suffer even more. This is how God has been satisfied against our sins. And then what do they do? They take and put a crown of thorns on Jesus, on his head. They struck Jesus with their hands. Can you imagine that? They're literally beating Jesus and hitting him in his face. Then they took Jesus and they crucified him with hands and his feet and his hands. His feet and his and his hands, nails in his hands and his feet. Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine that? Now there's a couple different ways to crucify. One way is, is to take the cross and you nail through the ankles straight in to the side. In fact, this is what it would have looked like. This is a petrified piece of a crucifixion with the spike going through with both the wood and the bone going through into the cro into that cross. Another way to crucify is to put a third board on the cross and you nail straight down into the ankles and it would have looked something like this. Now the reason that they do this is because they position the body in such a way that it pushes up the diaphragm into the person's lungs and it causes the person not to be able to breathe. And so every two minutes you have to either push up from the side with them going, the spikes going through your ankles, or you push up from the top of this board off of your tippy toes. You, you, you push yourself up, take a breath, and then you slump back down again and you go up and down. You push up and down. And sometimes this went on for three to four days, according to history. But with Jesus, it lasted six hours. And then he stopped pushing and said it was finished. And he died. And to make sure he was dead, the soldier came along, took a spear, and pierced Jesus' side with it causing a sudden flow of blood and water, putting the spear into his side, making sure that he was dead. This is how you satisfy God's wrath against our terrible, wicked, evil sins. It came at the highest cost. Think about these things as we sit and we take this bread that represents his body and we take this cup that represents his blood. Remember these things as we sit at his table and may this spur us on to sin less and to follow Jesus wherever he goes. I hope this helped. God bless you. It was a hard lesson, but this is what happened. We'll see you next time.